Hello, welcome to Tales War Gamer. I'm your host, Rob. This is going to be my first look review at the Flesh Eater Courts book for 2023. This book has just dropped with an amazing set of new models, and this is the kind of like first look that I've got. I don't have an NDA, I don't get early access, so thank you to the community who built a PDF off screenshots from all the men who read, men and women, I guess, who read book. So that was awesome. Thank you very much. Letting me review this fairly early, which I'm really excited about. And kind of to spoiler it, because I record the intro at the end of doing this. I've been recording for about eight or nine hours today. This is an amazing book. You're going to do some amazing stuff with this book. So have a great time. And just a shout out, if you enjoy this video, then please do share it with your friends, like and subscribe, because that way more people will see this video and they'll learn how to play this army and do some other stuff. So I hope you enjoy what we're about to talk about. Thanks very much. See you guys soon. But your whole army is going to be flesh eater courts and you'll gain battle traits. These are rules that will affect your whole army depending and won't affect, won't change based on which sub faction you choose. Okay, let's start with the very simple and easy ones. First one is Deathless Courtier. You get a six up ward on your army. You make armor saves, then you make a ward save, and it's a six plus. This is Again, a nice bonus. This is a nice bonus. However, it's so frustrating watching people rock six plus ward saves. It's so annoying. But sure, a six plus ward for the whole. At this point, it's kind of a, a rules holdover from before, but it's fine. The math is okay. Next up is we are going to talk about, and this is going to be important, we're going to talk about noble deeds. This is a huge kind of like part that you're going to have to learn and is going to require quite a bit of bookkeeping for your army. Each one of your heroes is going to be able to generate noble deeds, okay? You have the need for deeds. Need for deeds is what you've got. Okay, so what are noble deeds? Each one of your heroes can get up to six noble deeds and you track them and you use those uh, noble deeds for different things. How you generate them is there's loads of different ways. And as we go through it, you're going to see that there's multiple ways to kind of like stack this on top of each other. So the first way you get it is each time a friendly flesh eater courts hero successfully casts a spell that is not unbound, give one noble deed point to that hero. Some of you casters are two cast wizards. So just casting two spells is going to already get you to you, a third of your way to your six cap. Each time a prayer is chanted by a friendly flesh eater courts hero is answered, give one noble deed to that hero. So that's fine. Each time a friendly flesh eater courts hero fights, after all of its attacks are resolved, give that hero a number of noble deeds equal to the number of wounds and or mortal wounds caused by that hero in that phase that were allocated to enemy units. Do not count wounds and or mortal wounds that were caused by the hero's mount. Now, there's a couple of kind of like, I guess, uh, pedantic things really to talk about here. Number one. If your mount does do damage and the character on top of the mount does damage, you assign that damage at the same time, or specifically you allocate, that's where, how it's worded, at the same time. So you make armor saves, then you make ward saves, and you take the damage pool, and then you allocate that damage. After you've allocated that damage, um, if let's say you do 10 damage with your mount and only three damage with your character, then your opponent can choose to take all of the 10 damage uh, from the mount and then not have the three damage count because um, any damage done after a unit is wiped out is negated and doesn't count. However, let's just skip past that because that's kind of boring, especially if you're, like, you're new to the hobby and you're just excited about running a bunch of ghouls. And the important thing here is that heroes in combat are going to generate a lot of deed points very fast. And like we've said, getting up to six is really, really good for this army. So you're going to want to do that as fast as possible. Most of your heroes no, don't necessarily want to be frontline fighters, but of course, a ghoul king on Terrorgeist or Ushran are going to love being in front of combat, and they're going to do enough damage consistently that they're going to be always topped up to six, especially as it's each combat phase. So I think you're going to be quite likely to be able to um, get to the get to that six quite quickly. The last one is each flesh each flesh eater courts hero can have a maximum of six noble deed points at any one time. It cannot be given any more. The number of noble deed points. Uh, it has reduced to six. So you can only have six noble deed points. That's it. So that's the way. Cast spells, do prayers, do combat. Super simple. That's the easiest way. Okay, so you've got a bunch of noble deeds in your hands. What can you do with your noble deeds? First thing we're going to talk about is feeding frenzy. This lets you add one attack 
to the attack's characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly flesh eater quartz units while they're wholly within 12 inches of any friendly heroes that have six noble deed points. Now, this is obviously going to make a lot of sense if you have Ushran in the middle of combat fighting with a bunch of people. He's got six deed points. You've got some knights next to him. He's going to add plus one attack onto everything. The thing that you're going to want to uh, look at here, this is quite important, is you need six noble deed points to make this happen, although there are ways to manipulate that and make that lower. And also, if you are trying to add plus one attack, you're going to want to try and put it on units that either have multiple attack profiles, like the Bat Knights, or they just have a ton of bodies so that you are getting a good economies of scale, like a good return basically on investment. But you don't have to spend the feeding uh, the noble D points. You just have to have six noble D points, which is really good. So plus one attack on everyone is a huge positive. It's in every single uh, combat phase. So it's in my turn and your turn. So this feels this feels good. Then it means you're going to always be battling around some sort of hero or you're going to be trying to battle around some sort of hero. There are two types of keyworded heroes. There are abhorrent heroes and there are courtier heroes. Uh, one of them represents like the royalty and one's only the lowly nobility, unfortunately. But these heroes both do different things with your deed points. Specifically, you have two abilities or two battle traits that keyword in with those different types of heroes. With courtier heroes, you've got the ability to do muster guard. At the end of your movement phase, each friendly courtier can spend one of their noble deed points to return one slain model to a friendly serfs unit. So that'll be things like ghouls. That is within 10 inches of them. Doesn't have to be wholly within 10 inches, which is really good. Or two of their noble D points to return one slain model to a friendly knight's unit. That is within 10 inches of them. So again, think of the knight's units. Think of more of the monstrous infantry. So serfs will be the smaller infantry, and then the knights will be the larger infantry. Well, not cavalry infantry, the larger models, basically. You can use this ability multiple times each turn as long as the required noble deed points are available. Now, this means you get a lot of recursion in the army. And based on what I know about the book later on, we're going to be able to do a lot of recursion. And generating a lot of noble deed points to produce even more recursion is going to be something you want to do constantly. So think about that character you've already got in combat who's generated six noble deed points, and now he's going to be like, cool, I'm going to put six um, three knights back, or I'm going to put six serfs back, or something like that. It's going to be very, very effective in recursion. It's at the end of your movement phase, so that's quite nice. So you can move characters within range, you can move units within range, so you're not doing it in the hero phase, so you're kind of out of position because of something early. You can move everyone in, so you can get in range, so it's going to be really good. So expect to be able to bring a lot of models back into the army. Now, if you have an abhorrent hero with some deed points, you're going to be able to use summon loyal subjects, and this is insane. This is so insane. It's awesome if you are playing Flesh of Your Courts. If you're the Age of Sigma meta, then that's a great question. I don't know. At the end of your movement phase, so again, at the end of your movement phase, each friendly abhorrent can spend six of their noble deed points to summon loyal subjects. If they do so, you pick one friendly serfs or knights unit. So again, we're just going to use uh, ghouls and the bat knights here as an example. Uh, that has been destroyed and add a new replacement unit identical to that unit to your army with half the models from that unit that was destroyed rounding up. Now, this is fine. This is very much like uh, what you would do with Gloomspike Gits as an example, or you would do with Flesh Eater Courts, or not Flesh Eater Courts, sorry, Soap Like Grave Lords. But this is actually a bit of a negative because you do need to generate six points before you can make that happen. In addition, it has to be nine inches away from your opponent versus within three inches of your opponent. So it has more limitations than some of the other abilities that you see inside of the game. Uh, and also when you spend those noble deed points, that means you're now not going to be using feeding frenzy. Okay. Replacement units must be set up wholly within six inches of the edge of the battlefield, more than nine inches from all enemy units. Now, this is quite nice because this doesn't stipulate it needs to be near a gravesite, which you can block off if you're playing Soul Black Grave Lords kind of, uh, or like Loon Shrines, which you can blow up. Each destroyed unit can only be replaced once. Replacement units cannot be themselves replaced. This is all, so far, fairly normal. Each one of these kind of recursion mechanics you see in the game all are slightly different. This is Flesh Eater Quartz version, and it's good, but, you know, it comes at a resource. So I'm going to hear you say, Rob, it's going to be quite hard to produce that resource, so like Grave Lords get it for free, etc. I think there's a good conversation there. The bit that's nuts is the next bit. Remaining models which are not set up as part of the replacement unit count as having been slain and can be returned to the replacement unit using the muster guard ability or rally command ability. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's really crazy. 
really, really crazy. So if I take, let's say, a unit of nine knights, I know they're 150 points for a unit of three. If I reinforce them up to a unit of nine, so it's 450 points, I send them in, I do loads of fight, and eventually they die. I return the unit with my six noble deed points. Then... Uh, now that's the end of the movement phase, but then if I could start doing the healing later, uh, because I could do the muster guard ability. So what I could do is I could, I could, <laughs> I can, um, uh, I can bring them back, and then I can do the muster guard ability. So I can then get them like so. It has to be nine inches away, right? So I return a unit of nine knights. So I'll round up. So it's going to be a unit of five. I've spent six noble deed points. Then I start using more noble deed points from another hero to start returning those models back into that unit. So that unit of that unit just gets returned to full health, which is bonkers, like truly insane, truly insane. Uh, I assume that's going to be FAQ'd so that you can only do one. I mean, it's literally written into the core rule of that how that works. This is this is just rally. This is like everyone had six up rally. Then everyone had a four up rally. Then everyone had a four up rally in combat. This is just uh, Age of Sigmar's scope creep. Um, as the rules writers get more blind to what recursion looks like in a game, they have to write something that's better than the version before, and so it scales up. And this is if I was a fresh equals player, I'd be like pumped to throw in loads of models, have them die, have them bring back. Do I think it'll be FAQ'd? Don't know. I'm not really sure. It's very good. The final battle trait, or like the kind of core ones, are the Court of Delusions special rule. In the first battle round, after the players have received their starting command points, before the, uh, before the start of the first turn, you can pick one of the following delusions to apply for the battle. Now, this is obviously really good because this lets you list tailor your army a little bit and how it's going to work on the tabletop, which is actually very, very effective. I really like this, and I think it's really good. Okay, so like, if I was a Flesh Eat Thoughts player, I'd be like stoked that I could choose a buff for my army at the start of the each game. It's really good. First one, Royal Hunt, add one to wound rolls for attacks made by Flesh Eater Quartz units that target a monster. This is obviously nuts, because if you're playing Gargants, this is just, just going to shut them down. But what's lovely is that I don't have to pre-pick it, and I just start to play, I see Gargants, I'm like, cool, my entire army is going to get plus one damage. Uh, sorry, plus one to wound, plus one to wound, which is very effective. Like, you can't really, like, minus one to wound is probably one of the best debuffs, with the exception of, like, you know, Cathalar, you can't move, and Bellicors and stuff. So it's really good. Next one, Crusading Army, add one to run rolls and charge rolls for friendly flesh eater quartz units. This is good if you can deep strike a lot of units in your army, uh, especially as we know some of those units also get plus one to charge. So coming out of deep strike, you can have, uh, you know, you're nine inches away, plus one from this, plus one from, you know, a Bannerman or something, gives you a seven inch charge. You can use a command ability to re-roll it, so a seven inch re-rollable charge is really good. Or if you just deploy it on the board, units that can run and charge, um, this is very effective for those as well, because you're basically adding plus two to that. Uh, so your threat range is being a little bit different a little bit longer is really good especially if you end up building like more of an alpha army it's 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 okay it's definitely not the one you're going to pick but it's, it's good defends the realm add one to save rolls for friendly flesh equals units while they're contesting an objective that you control now this isn't bad but most of the armor saves for this army are in the five plus and four plus category so plus one to save to these is honestly is not bad I want to be really clear. And then when you do Mystic Shields and you do all that defense, you really start to change the numbers on how much you're going to lose these models. But it does feel like that they're built to heal into versus, you know, they're meant to armor tank. And there is there is and can be a lot of rend in the game. So this doesn't feel like it's effective enough. Next one, Grand Tournament. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by fresh, friendly fresh of course, heroes that are not the general if they made a charge move in the same turn. Let's just, just ignore that. Last one is probably the best one. Feast Day. The Feeding Frenzy ability applies to friendly Flesh Eater Quartz units while they're wholly within 12 inches of any friendly heroes that have four or more noble deeds instead of six noble deeds. And to remind ourselves what that is, Feeding Frenzy is where you can have plus one attack to the attack characteristic of units within range of a hero. Um, and so that's going to be very good. So probably that's the one you'll see the most so that you always get those plus one uh, that, oh, that plus one attack on all of your units, making them much more offensive. I would say that's probably the one you're going to see. You don't need to get as many D points. It means you can do a bit of healing as well, return some models, and you're still at that four cap, which is quite good. So Feast Day is definitely the one I think you'll see most often, but you might see some of the other ones if uh, people are playing different styles of army. One of the other things that you get is a set of new heroic actions for your army. And there's two, if you're playing Flesh Eater Courts, Delusions of Grandeur. 
Okay, so this is done in your hero phase, and this is obviously in addition to other heroic actions that you can do. And there are two. One of them's good, and one of them's amazing. Uh, the first one that's good, Scent of Blood. Pick one friendly fleshy quartz hero and roll a dice. On a three plus, you can make a D6 inch move with that hero, but it must finish its move more than three inches from all enemy units and closer to an enemy unit that, ha that has any wounds allocated to it. One of the things I quite like about this is maybe the opportunity to move into unbinding range in your opponent's turn when they weren't expecting it. That's a fun little thing. Maybe doing a little move block in. Not quite as good as Murder Lust, but that's quite fun as well. Or if you're using Big Beefcake Ushran, just get a little bit closer to the enemy that you're going to smite. It's pretty good. It's on a 3+, plus though, so it's a bit iffy. Maybe a command point's more effective, uh, so it's fine. Like it, it, It'll come up in some situations. But what will come up in every situation is the heroic action, Rousing Oration. Pick one friendly, fleshy, of course, hero, and roll a dice for each other friendly unit, fleshy, of course, unit, sorry, uh, wholly within 12 inches of that hero. For each 5+, plus, you gain one Noble D point for that hero. So we talked about generating Noble D points is going to be really valuable. At the end of the video, we're probably going to talk about tempo and how this army is going to play. And you're obviously going to start with no noble deed points. So immediately on turn one, if your whole army is kind of clumped around a hero, we can get ourselves a hero who has six-ish noble deed points. There's a really nice list building conversation here. Do you have big reinforced units of knights, which means you've got less units so that when you try to do this heroic action, you won't roll as many dice to try and get five ups. Or will you go for a more MSU build where you'll try and you know manipulate that to get lots of deeds? It's a great question. Like it's going to take a while to work out. It's quite fun, but it definitely is very powerful, and it definitely means that you're going to generate a lot more noble deed points than you initially thought you were going to do at the start. So this is kind of balked. Um, so it's very, very good, very, very effective, and you'll do this, and you'll do this in your opponent's turn, and you'll do this in your turn. That's what's crazy. If, for instance, I'm going, uh, we're playing a game you take the first turn and you move everything forward. My heroic action, I'm going to do Rousing Oration. And then in my turn, I'm going to do Rousing Oration. So I could potentially have two heroes on the first turn with quite a lot of Noble Deeds, which is very good. Yeah, very, very, very good. The other kind of like, I guess a battle trait, allegiance ability that you get for playing Flesh Eater Courts is that you get to run the charnel throne or you get a terrain you get a terrain piece as a battle trait as a faction ability you get a free terrain piece doesn't cost you any points doesn't cost you any points at all and that is the charnel carnal 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 is different to charnel i think i think carnal is a sexy throne and i think this is a well it it's definitely a, a throne where you do a lot of bones you do a lot of boning on here anyway Anyway, <laughs> you set this up uh, wholly within your territory. And now this is always really important because depending on the battle plan, territories are sometimes like all the way across the board. Sometimes they're only a little section of the board. You don't get a lot of space. That's your setup, right? So this is going to be quite effective. Sometimes you might want it to be quite far forward. Sometimes you're not going to want it to be quite far forward uh, because it's got a couple of different features. Uh, it's defensible, so it's a garrison effectively, and you can garrison one flesh of course, hero that has a wound character characteristic up to seven and you're going to do this every time and you're going to do this because of the rule ruler of all they survey at the start of your hero phase add d3 noble d points to any friendly flesh of course heroes that is garrisoning that terrain feature so now we know that we have a hero that's generating d3 and they're probably going to be a spell caster so they'll cast a couple of spells so now we're going to be up to on average about four uh just for that character already which is pretty fun. Then we've done a couple of heroic actions and we've generated more. So we might have two or three different heroes with close to maximum deed points on the first turn. We haven't even really moved. So very effective. It also has another rule, which is going to come into effect as to why you're going to maybe want to position it further forward or where the territories are is going to be quite important because one enemy unit is within 12 inches of this terrain feature. It cannot be affected by any abilities that allow you to ignore Battle shock test. So this will be things such as inspiring presence command ability, which is quite effective. Like, and it's also quite nice because you can effectively like you can group up around it if someone's going to alpha strike you and run across the board. Um, you can just be like, cool, run across. You can't use inspiring presence, start hitting people. It's quite nice. 
I quite like it. But you're definitely 100p going to be getting a lot of deed points out of this bad boy. Each one of your monsters also gains access to a new monstrous rampage or some monstrous rampages. There are two. Uh, one of them is called Delectable Appetizers, and one's called Blood Curdling Shriek. Delectable Appetizers lets you pick an enemy unit that has a wounds characteristic of two or less, and is within three inches, and then on a three plus, you do D3 mortal wounds. For each mortal wound that is not negated, then this uh, monster can heal. This is for Royal Terror Geist and Royal Zombies only. Royal Zombie Dragons, which we kind of talked about. We're not sure if it is like a royal dragon that's become a zombie, a royal zombie that's also a dragon. Either way, we know it's definitely representative of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, but it's a royal terror geist or a real zombie dragon. The important part to know is that this is a nothing burger. Potentially healing up to three is fine, whatever. You'll remember it or you won't remember it. Uh, it may be quite nice if you stack this on a monster, if you're also doing heroic recovery, like if you're doing a, you know, a ghoul king on terror geist, for instance, in heroic recovery, do this monstrous action in combat. You know, you're healing quite a bit there. It's kind of okay. The other one, Blood Curling Shriek, is a little bit better. Pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a three plus, subtract two from the bravery characteristic of that enemy unit until the end of the turn. The reason this is quite good is because this is obviously going to stack with Ushron, which we'll talk about later. Other bravery reducing effects, which will be in effect as well. And then making it so that the enemy units might suffer battle shock tests more is always a positive. So they're fine. Um, probably the bravery one is probably the more important one, but the healing one might be good as well. Now we look at the command traits. When you have a general in your army, you can have one command trait. And so it's really important to choose one that really benefits your army. There are six command traits in this, and they're broken up into three for abhorrence and three for courtiers. So there's a, such a standout one that I'm gonna, which I'm going to read at the end, that everything else is kind of going to, it's depressed my ability to talk about the other ones, but we'll talk about them. First one is shadowy obfuscation. This is for an abhorrent general. This general is not visible to the enemy models more than 12 inches away from them. Now, this is quite good. It reminds me of Mirror Shield from Stormcast. And if you end up taking a character that you do really want to keep, uh, you know, long range threats from getting at, then this is not bad. Feverish Scholar, you add one to casting rolls, dispelling rolls, and unbinding rolls to this general. That has six noble deeds, but you do need to get six noble deeds to that come into effect. And add two to the casting rolls. Oh, sorry, it's always plus one, and it's plus two if you have six noble deeds. It's good as well. Like, it makes you have a very reliable caster, and if you do end up wanting a more reliable caster, then that's a good, honestly, a good one, And but does require you to use those noble deeds and then not spend them in the right situation. Then you have Master of Menageries. When using the Summon Loyal Subjects Battle Trade, you can pick one friendly flesh eater corps monster that is not a hero that has been destroyed and instead of a service or knights unit you can spend those six noble deed points to set to summon that and allocate it six wounds this is okay but unfortunately what isn't okay is the zombie dragon uh, or the terror geist as monsters so you probably don't want to summon them uh, you definitely want, don't want to spend six points on them uh, so and you don't want to take this command trait Next one is for the nobility. So this is courtier generals. You have Strong Grid Madness, which is you add two to the general's wounds characteristic, which is honestly very good. And while this general has six noble deed points, you have a ward save of five plus. The problem with this is again, you're more defensive if you don't spend the noble deed points. Same as before. If you don't spend the noble deed points, then you're better at casting. But that requires you to not spend the noble deed points, which means you aren't resurrecting units or you aren't healing units by returning models. So like they, they're a resource that you want to spend versus a resource you want to keep, in my opinion. And then you've got Savage Beyond Reason. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by a melee weapon by the general is a six, the attack scores, six hit, uh, scores two hits instead of one, so you've got exploding sixes. If this general is has six noble deed points, then it's three. Again, great, but don't spend the points. Which all brings us to the best command trait, and arguably the only one, which is Cruel Taskmaster. If this general uses the ma Muster Guard ability, uh, which is where you would heal a model um, into a unit that's been slain, you can return models to unit, reduce the number of deeds cost for each return model by one. Or if the cost was already one, you can bring back one additional model instead. Now, this is written as if it wasn't... <laughs> like is it, It's quite funny. This is clearly trying to obfuscate what it's trying to do. They're like, yeah, like reduce it down by one. You can only return knight models and surf models. So what they're saying is return knights on one deed point instead of two, 
or generate two serfs. So this does mean that you'll be able to put six serfs back into a unit, but what it really means is you can bring back six knight models from this general, and that's bonkers genuinely bonkers um being able to return like six three wound models into a unit like really really good so i would say cruel taskmaster is the thing you can see taken the most um and like because it just does so much for your army all the time so that's definitely the one we're going to see next up we're looking at the artifacts don't forget you can take more than one artifact if you do take a battalion that lets you do so but normally you start with one free artifact okay let's talk about them if you have an abhorrent hero there are three the grim garland the blood river chalice and the heart of the gargan the grim garland is actually bravery minus two to units within nine inches versus bravery minus one i've got that wrong on the first read so a little bit of a pickup make sure i get the right info out there we want to be spreading misinformation this does mean we're starting to build up the ability to definitely reduce the bravery of units around us quite drastically ushran uh, monstrous actions and now this is that going to pay off? I'm not sure, but maybe. Blood River Chalice, once per battle in the hero phase, the bearer can is use this artifact. If they do so, heal up to 2d3 wounds allocated to the bearer. This is okay. It's once per battle. You've got to use it at the right time. Heal up to four wounds, but probably not. It definitely isn't an economies of scale artifact that I'll take, so I don't really particularly like this. Heart of the Gargan, once per battle, the start of the combat phase, the bearer can use artifact. If they do so, add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by the bearer and then mount in that phase. This isn't bad, especially when you obviously stack this with Feeding Frenzy, so you get plus two, but are those plus two attacks actually going to do tons and tons of damage? Are they damage five? In which case, once per battle is not that much, so I probably wouldn't take that. The three others that we get for the noble, court, the, the noble heirlooms, which for the courtiers, is the Medal of Badness, the Flay Pennant, and the Charnel Vestments. Medal of Badness is once per battle, the bearer can issue a command without a command point being spent, and they're treated as if they were general to do so. So doing a command ability from 18 inches away, it's quite nice, probably not what I'm going to do. The Flay Pennant, you can reroll charge rolls for a friendly flesh of course units while they're holding within 12 inches of the bearer. Now this is my second favourite one, comfortably. Your army is uh, effectively a combat army, there's lots of combat that's going to happen, so rerolling charges for everyone without needing to spend CP is good, uh, in my opinion, especially if you're doing lots of charges, especially if you have lots of units with retreat and charge. You could potentially run a lot of like MSU stuff, retreat and charging, reroll charges. Uh, flying units, this works really well on as well, because you could potentially roll a bigger charge and fly over screens. So that's not bad. But easily the best one is the charnel or carnal for the Sineshi players, vestments. The bearer gains the priest keyword. And the reason for this is this lets you stack utility on a single character. This means that, and also you generate more deed points. This means you can have a wizard who's going to be doing all your like support piece spells, while in addition is also going to be doing prayers, both of which generate you deed points. So you can again stack how many deed points you generate on a hero very quickly, which is nice. So I think this is the obvious one. Um, and I think the others being once per battle as well make them definitely out. A lot of the Age of 3 books have effectively one command trait, one artifact that people see all the time. You see that for Corn, you see that for Seraphon. You know, it tends to mix and match, but some of them just stand out. And this one stands out because it keys in with how the army wants to work, which is generate deed points. With your Flesh of Court's army, you gain access to the spell law, the law of madness, which is pretty cool. There are three spells, Masmor Shroud, Deranged Transformation, and Crimson Victuals. Only one of these is good, the other two are pretty nothing. First one, which is a bit of a nothing, is Miasmal Shroud. It's got a casting value of 6 and a range of 18 inches. Now, if you cast it on a 10, then you're going to get to roll 8 dice versus 6 dice if you roll below a 10. But this is important, it's an unmodified dice roll. So you're going to be able to add primal dice, because we're in the season with loads of primal dice, so you should always be able to get over a 10 if you wanted to. Either way, if you cast it on a 10 or more, then you're going to roll 8 dice, and if you roll it below 10, it's going to be 6 dice, and if any of those two dice are the same, then the enemy suffers a mortal wound. Almost doesn't feel like it was worth reading out. If it, three of those dice are the same number, then the enemy unit is minus one to hit. And if four of those dice are the same number, which I haven't even run the math on, but I assume is statistically really unlikely, they're also minus one to wound. It sucks, don't do this. Okay, the other one that sucks is Crimson Victuals. It's cast on six, and it's got a range of 18 inches. Okay, I mean, it doesn't suck. It's kind of okay. It's kind of okay. That's what I'm going to put it as, like, this is fine. Um, it basically, you choose an enemy, uh, one of your friendly units that's only got one wound, a wound's characteristic of one, so it's going to be one of the surf units or the bodyguard units. And then 
a unit that's within six of them takes d3 mortal wounds unless you cast it on a 10 or more in which case it's 2d3 mortal wounds again let's add some primal dice for each mortal wound that gets uh, that suffered that unit your friendly unit that you targeted is going to gain a model back so you basically engulify a unit that's within six inches of one of your units that's within 18 inches and that's honestly not bad if you're planning on you know healing a lot of ghouls into a unit 2d3 is pretty good you could put six ghouls back into you that's pretty fun uh so yeah if you've got loads of cast spare then i definitely would see you doing this but the most important one the one that you're going to throw all of your dice out is deranged transformation this spell uh, is casting value of six and a range of 24 inches which is dumb if successfully cast pick one friendly flesh of quartz unit wholly within range of 24 inches and visible to the caster and has a wounds characteristic of seven or less so that's going to be all of your like you know your ghouls uh your uh crypt horrors uh, your knights any of those units okay do your next hero phase you add two inches to that unit's move characteristic okay pretty good but the important one and add one to wound rolls for attacks made by that unit and you're like okay one unit roll plus two move plus one to wound it's not that good if the casting roll was 10 or more you can pick up to three different friendly units to be affected by the spell instead of one so that means now three units are getting plus two to move and they're getting plus one uh, to wound and that's super good because your army's a combat army now we're going to get plus one attack from a feeding frenzy we're going to be moving faster we're going to be healing models but importantly we're going to get plus one to wound really good plus one attack plus one to wound massive maths loads of buffs you're really gonna you got to work to make it happen or just throw loads of primal dice at it, any of those things moving on to the spell law the rites of delusion these are for the priests in the army and there are three and i like I like all three. You've got Bless This Meal, the Summer King's Fervor, and we've also got the Carnal Conviction. Okay, Bless This Meal is a prayer that has an answer value of three and a range of 18 inches. If answered, pick one enemy unit within range that is visible to the chanter. Each time a model from that enemy unit is slain, you can heal one wound allocated to a friendly flesh eater quartz unit within six inches of that enemy unit. So you're not going to be able to return models to the unit, but importantly, and the bit that I like the most, is you are going to be able to heal up your big monsters very effectively. This feels honestly pretty crazy in effect. You're going to pick a unit and then Ushran's going to go into them or a Ghoul King on Terror Geist as an example. And then at the end of the combat, he's just going to keep healing how many damage got done, even if that model didn't do the damage. And it's within six inches. So I could charge a unit of Bat Knights in, wipe that unit out and heal everything over into like a big monster like it's really good <laughs> it's really like like i don't know why people don't think this isn't this i think this is broken like close to broken i think this is very good uh, next one summer king's favor is a prayer as a value of three and a range of 18 inches if answer is six inches sorry i need to go back bless this meal is six inches so I, a unit within six inches not wholly within six inches of the unit that i chose to be the prayer heals for each model slain it's mind-blowing okay next one is summer king's favor prayer that has a value of three and a range of 18 inches if answered pick one friendly flesh eater quartz hero hold him in range visible to the chanter until your next hero phase that hero gains one additional noble deed point each time they slay an enemy model now i think it's fair to say that at this stage we already think we can generate a lot of deed points that's cool however that might get nerfed I'm not saying it will or it even needs to but it might so having this might be good you may also just want to absolutely snack up on how many d points you get and this is going to help you i don't honestly see this as a bad thing it might not be efficient but it's definitely not bad so i think it's good and then the next one is charnel conviction this is a prayer that has an answer value of three in a range of 18 inches. Pick a friendly flesh eater quartz unit, hold you in a range, visible to the chanter, and they get a five up ward save, which is also really, really good. Five up ward save. You have that on a big block of horrors, have that on a big block of knights. Don't forget, this is already an army that could potentially. So we've taken the command trait already, where we can bring back six knights. So I've got a unit of nine knights and i charge him in and i do loads of fighting and i murder some stuff and then you hit me back and you kill i don't know how many of you kill of them but you probably won't wipe the unit out because they have a five at ward save now and then i bring six of them back all with a five at ward save i'm going for it 
I think all three are good. I think all three are maybe even excellent. The most important thing to talk about with these Battle Tome reviews is how the army wins games. And obviously how you construct your army and how the army wants to play. Like, is it going to be an all combat army? Is it an all shooting army? Is important. But the most important thing in Age of Sigmar 3, unfortunately, isn't really even what the units do. It's the battle tactics and the grand strategies that come in your book. As an example, the most successful army in the game right now is Big War. They have the highest win rate of all the other armies out there at the moment and that's because in a battle scroll update a few months ago they got given two different buffs one of them was a new battle tactic that you could use for iron jaws and one that you could use for the cruel boys however you can coalesce those together in a big war army and when you do do that you end up with a very scary army that could just achieve battle tactics super simple so in this example uh, we're going to look at the book battle tactics. So you have the battle tactics from the GHB and you have the book tactics from here. With the last book that we did, which was Cities of Sigmar, uh, the book was like basically telling you that you should take Fusiliers. It was like, take Fusiliers. Like there's a, a battle, there was like three battle tactics for Fusiliers or two at least. And then there was another one for the um, the command corps. So you kind of would want to build those into your army or you would have to try and rely on the general's handbook battle tactics. The ones for these, um, for Flesh Eater Courts, are quite nice. They're quite disparate, and they aren't necessarily telling you you have to take a unit. So for the grand strategies, we've got legendary exploits. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy. If there are at least three friendly Flesh Eater Courts heroes on the battlefield, and they each have six noble deeds. You can't guarantee that. That's difficult to do. Um, uh, so, yeah, just don't do that. Expand the kingdom. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy. If a friendly abhorrent is wholly within enemy territory and the enemy general is not within your territory. I quite like that idea. It's quite fun narratively. But you can't necessarily guarantee that your abhorrent is going to be alive at the end. And you can't necessarily guarantee that it won't be in your territory. So that's a no. And then defend the territory. Sorry, defend the throne. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy. If a friendly charnel throne is on the battlefield, it is garrisoned by a friendly flesh of courts hero and there are no enemy units within range within six inches of it that's probably the one that you're most likely to take however um there's magical dominance for instance from sorry supreme sorcery whichever one it is the magic grand strategy one from the ghb is the one that is currently cho spell casting savant that's what it's called um is the most commonly taken grand strat at the moment and because it's just very achievable but the defend the throne feels like a good one if you're going to go for a pure flesh eater course one for the battle tactics, it gets a little bit more interesting. Battle tactics, you've got Scream to Death. Pick one enemy unit on the battlefield to complete this battle tactic. If this unit is destroyed this turn by an attack made by a missile weapon used by friendly Crypt Flares or Crypt Infernal Courtier or a Royal Terror Geist. This is very achievable. There's very much a shooting build that is going to come out of this book around Crypt Flares. So this is going to be a very achievable one. Valiant Slaying, pick one enemy monster on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic if that unit is destroyed during this turn by an attack made by friendly abhorrent. Definitely the, the monsters, Ushran and the other abhorrents definitely could do this, but it does rely on your opponent bringing a monster. So it's probably one you're going to choose the least or have option to do the least. Overrun is one you're going to do late in the game. You complete this battle tactic if every enemy unit on the battlefield is within three inches of a freshly flesh eater courts unit at the end of the turn. Obviously, if they don't have many units left at the end, which is the hope, this is going to be an achievable one. Glorious Feast, you might be able to do at the beginning of the game. You complete this battle tactic if every friendly unit on the battlefield is wholly within 12 inches of a friendly Flesh Eater Courts hero that has six noble deed points at the end of the turn. And don't forget, with the heroic action, casting spells, being a priest, all those other stuff for generating heroic uh, glorious deeds, this could be something you achieve turn one. Having the rest of your army still wholly within 12, though, might be more difficult uh, because you're going to want to move on to objectives and do those things. Lance Formation, you complete this battle tactic if two or more friendly knight units made a charge move this turn, and charge rolls for each of those units are seven or more. Now, there are ways to stack pluses to charge in this army, and as we talked about earlier, there's even a way to get reroll charges on the army as well. And that might be quite nice for being able to achieve this, but it does require you to have lots of knights models. So if you don't have knights models, you won't be getting this. Last one, Ties of Chivalry. Pick one objective on the battlefield your opponent controls. You complete this battle tactic if you control the objective at the end of your turn. And it's contested by one friendly Surf, one friendly Knight model, and one friendly Courtier model. So this requires you to have a mixed set of models and be able to grab an objective, which is good. So overall, they're not like easy gimmies like you see with Daughters of Cain or Carriage and Overlords uh, or some of those other armies. And definitely not the pity tactics that we've seen that they put out in 
the most recent kind of like uh, battle scroll updates. But similarly, they're not impossible to achieve. And it just requires you to think maybe about your army list or how you're going to play with it. The general sandbook ones are fairly achievable as well. So I definitely think you could score five tactics with this. Most of these, though, do require you to be like, with the exception of Glorious Feast, where you generate uh, your points, you're going to have to be a little bit aggressive. You're going to have to move forward. Uh, so you can't play passive, which some of the other armies can do with their battle tactics. So this does put kind of a ticking clock on you scoring points. So that's something to be conscious of. You also, before we get onto the War Scrolls, you also get to bring a bunch of Ender Spells, or you get access to three Ender Spells and whether or not you're going to take them. You're definitely going to take one, but you might be take th all three. Who knows? Let's talk about them. The first one is, oh, what order do we want to go in? Do we want to go in utterly broken? Let's start with the Chalice of Ushran. It's 50 points. It's on a circular base, and it's a predatory Ender Spell, which means it's going to move at the end of each hero phase. Uh, in order to bring Ender Spells in your army, I should talk about that, because it might be the first time you've ever heard about an, how to build an army, you need a wizard in your army, and that means you get to bring an Ender Spell. You can only bring up to three Ender Spells when you're playing 2,000 points, and um, and you need a wizard for each Ender Spell you bring. So three wizards, three Ender Spells, maximum. Okay, so the Chalice of Ushran, 50 points, and it's cast on a six, and it's got a set range of 20 four inches which is crazy because you set it up and then it's going to be able to move after so that's another 12 inches of movement for a potential sorry eight inches of movement so for a potential 32 inches of range if successfully cast set this endless spell holding within range and visible to the caster more than one inch from all models endless spells or invocations so what does it do it's got the special rule soul stealer Keep track of the number of models that are slain within 12 inches of this end of the spell. So that's going to be your models and their models. And at the end of each turn, roll a dice for each model that was slain within 12 inches of this end of the spell during that turn. For each 4+, plus, the commanding player can heal one wound allocated to a Flesh Eater Quartz model within 12 inches of this end of the spell or return one slain model to one Flesh Eater Quartz unit that has a wound's characteristic of one that's holding within 12 inches of this end of the spell. Okay. Let's talk about what this means mechanically, because there's going to be some amazing stuff. Let's say 20 models die within range of the chalice. That means at the end of the turn, and it's going to be the end of each turn, you're going to roll 20 dice, which means you're going to put 10 wounds back into a unit, or you're going to heal a unit 10 wounds. That's obviously going to be great on Ushran, for example, right? That's going to be really good. And we've already talked about the fact that you can already do a lot of healing. But if you, let's say, got Crypt Guard next to Ushran, you're going to be able to potentially bring up to 10 of those models back, which is going to be very, very good because they're going to be providing a ward save to Ushran, which is going to be awesome. This is probably an auto-include in your army because you're always healing your guys. There's no benefit to your opponent. doesn't benefit them at all. And it also means they're always going to be trying to dispel it or unbind it, um, and that's going to be really effective. So definitely an auto-include. What's a triple auto-include maybe like a quadruple auto include is the cadaverous barricade which is 20 points which is already a dumb points value for any endless spell okay it's cast on a five and you set it up within 24 inches very long range it's quite a long thin base um it's like a slice of a pizza and then <laughs> if successfully cast you set it up more than an inch from terrain features and uh other endless spells okay now, it counts as a terrain feature. After it's set up, this endless spell is treated as a terrain feature that has the grasping hand scenery rule, except that it can still be dispelled as if it were an endless spell. Okay, so it's got grasping hands. So it's like, it's very Hollywood. Okay, so what does that mean? Enemy units within three inches of this terrain feature cannot run or retreat within three inches, not wholly within three inches. So I can cast this and be like, you can't run or retreat. You just lock there which is nuts, okay? In addition, if an enemy model starts to move within three inches of this terrain feature, half the distance that model can move, uh, can make when it moves. Like, bonkers, bonkers. Because it's really, it's quite big. Now, it's again, only within three inches, but you can just put this right in front of your enemy and be like, those two units half move. Amazing. Another, like, or another unit, like, it's really good into Night Haunt as an example because they use a lot of retreat and charge. Can't do that anymore. And it's 20 points. The opportunity cost for 20 points to shut down your opponent's movement is very good. It's so good. It's, I can't be, like, buy this now. Go and buy it. Buy this now. It might get FAQ'd, but it's bananas. Okay. It's, it's really, really destructive for the game. This is really, it's really bad. Okay, so it's going to be, it'll be in every single list, 100% pick rate. 
And then finally, you've got the Corpse Mare Stampede, which is cast on a seven. It's got a range, a setup range of 3d6 inches. And then uh, it moves 12 inches and is a predator in the spell. It has a special rule trampled underfoot. For every unit it moves across, you roll six dice. Um, and then for every six, you do a mortal wound, or you do a mortal wound for each result that's over the wounds characteristic of the enemy unit. So basically, if it's a one wound, uh, one wound model unit, then every two plus will be a mortal wound. But if it's got six wounds, then it'll just be the sixes that do a mortal wound. This is okay. It's 60 points, but... You're already taking two under spells, one of which auto heals all your army, of one of which shuts down all your opponent's movement. You're winning so dry. Like, this is immediately go buy this box. If you want to play Flesh of Courts, immediate purchase, in my opinion. So, before we look at the Battle Scrolls, I know I did say that. I forgot we got to do sub factions, which is super fun. So, obviously, when you build your Flesh of Courts army, you can build your army into one of four different sub factions Morgant, Hollow Morn, Blisterkin and gristle core so morgan uh lets you have the uh the the new the new little crypt ghouls the crypt guard as your battle line and you get a special rule called morgan kingdoms give one noble deeds point to each friendly morgan fleshy a course hero at the end of the turn if that hero is contesting an objective now if you're aiming to build up a lot of deeds which at this point feels like they're not really deeds. They're just the easiest thing in the world to get. I'm not really... Uh, they, they don't feel very... They, well, they don't describe them as heroic deeds, I guess. They're just actions, I guess. Everyday jobs. Small tasks. Uh, then this is obviously the sub-faction view. Super easy to achieve, which is good. Hollow Morn feels like it's very good, and I know a lot of people are very excited about it, which is cool. This is Grizzly Cavaliers. This allows you to have Crypt Horrors as your battle line. So you can have a big unit of nine or two big units of nine is probably what some people will take. Add one to the damage characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Hollowmore Knights, units that have made a charge move in the same turn. This ability has no effect on attacks made by the mounts. So this is obviously going to be really good on Crypt Horrors, taking them up to damage three, or if they roll a six, damage four. If you sacrifice a, a Ghoul King, we'll talk about that later, potentially damage five, uh, which is good with four attacks base each. So a unit of three could be doing, you know, uh, 12 attacks, doing uh, damage four, which is pretty spicy. Uh, then obviously, if you do Feeding Frenzy, so it does feel like this is a very good one, especially as you want to be charging all the time. So that's Hollow Morn. That makes a lot of sense. It's also Ushran's sub-faction. Uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, all of the new stuff that's good and knights, and then Ushran is in this, and he's good. So it's like, who knew? Who knew? And then you've got Blisterkin. So this is where you flares. I'm standing flares at the minute. I think, like, initial read, I think flares have got, like, a lot of options here. They become battle line, so crit flares. They have pious nobility, friendly abhorrence, gain the priest keyword, but they cannot cast spells and chant prayers in the same hero phase. So no kind of direct bonus, like plus one damage, but instead you get a bit more utility as an option, which is, I guess, okay. It's, it's probably the weakest of the three, of the four, sorry. Then you've got Gristle Gore, Savage Strike. At the start of your combat phase, you can pick one friendly Gristle Gore monster on the battlefield. The strike first effect applies to that monster until the end of that phase. So I definitely do think there's going to be some sneaky builds which kind of move away from what the book is quite clearly trying to tell you, which is take some knights, take Usharan and go fight. And maybe this will work quite nicely if you can build yourself up a fairly fighting monster. Um, but I think, you know, I'm not really 100% certain that's going to be right. The economies of scale is just so much better on Hollow Morn versus Gristlecore. So I think... Hollow Morn will probably be the most popular. Morgan is good, and I think Blister Queen's fine. You might see Blister Queen if people want to take big units of nine flares, which I definitely could see. The first war scroll we're going to look at is Ushran, the Mortark of Delusion. And let me tell you, he is arguably maybe one of the best models that's come out in a long time. Like, as a miniature, he's wonderful. Rule set wise, I think if you're going to play Flesh Eater Courts, you probably build lists around him, and ultimately he might be maybe one of the best units now in Age of Sigmar, which is a pretty big pitch, but I think he definitely is that. He's 460 points, 16 wounds on a 4-up armor save. Isn't great 4-up armor save. You would have preferred a 3-up armor save. However, he is a life tank. This is important to talk about. He has a 5-up ward save, but if you do take a unit of Crypt Guard and they're holding within 3 inches of him, he's going to have a 4-up ward save. So 16 wounds on a 4-up, four 4-up four is crazy. 
And don't forget, we've already talked about using the Chalice of Ushran or also the Prayer so that you're going to be able to heal at two different points in a turn. The Chalice is at the end of a turn, and then the heal from combat is whenever... Well, the heal from the Prayer is whenever models are slain within range of him. So that's going to be also really good. So I think Ushran is probably at the point where uh, he survives almost everything. If you can't one-shot him, and 16 wounds on a 4-up ward save is going to make that very, very difficult, then I think he probably is close to immortal, which is crazy. Okay. In close combat, he's got three attack space uh, with his scepter, threes and twos, Ren two, damage D3 plus three, which is a nice damage profile. It's not overwhelming. Then he has 10 attacks, threes and threes, minus one, damage two, a classic Gargan, but that's still a lot of attacks. And don't forget, you're probably going to be getting out the plus one to wound aura spell on units, which I think is good. Uh, then you have plus one attack, obviously also from Feeding Frenzy, which is good. He's a two cast wizard that can cast two spells and unbind two spells. Talking of which, he's got an amazing spell. An amazing spell. It's called the Glimpse of Delusion. It's cast on a 7, and it's got a range of 18 inches. If, if per cast, you pick one enemy model within range and visible to the caster, then pick one melee weapon of that enemy model's arm with and pick another enemy unit within range of that weapon, that enemy model immediately makes combat attacks with that weapon targeting the other enemy unit. This, again, is going to be very, very effective in the game. Uh, like, holy hell. That's going to be very good. I love the con. I love the idea of picking a Gotrek to do this with. Have Gotrek accidentally smash up his own units. But this is great. Very good. And in some situations, you're going to be... You're going to be in such an incredible place. So, like, it's a great spell, really good spell. So he's also got an amazing spell. He's a war master, so he has got an aura of 18 inches for command abilities, which is good. He is the epicenter of delusion, which is a rule where if this unit is part of a fleshy court's army and you hear a phase, you can pick one delusion from the courts of delusion battle trait. Don't forget, you pick one at the start of the game. Start of the game, you pick one delusion. He picks one at the start. Uh, in your hero phase and pick one delusion from the courts until your next hero phase that delusion applies to a friendly flesh eater courts units while they're wholly within the epicenter of delusion which starts out at 30 inches which is great in addition to the delusion you pick before the start of the first turn so if you wanted to you could pick the feeding frenzy so everyone is just on a four which is going to be very good uh and like everyone only needs uh four points for the feeding frenzy which is i think is the right decision and then uh, he also is going to be able to like plus one against monsters if he's intending to have everyone charge a monster this turn. Plus one to charge feels like a really good one as well. So that's very good. Then he has the Carrying King. While this unit ha has six noble deed points, friendly flesh eater courts units are affected by feed and frenzy while they're wholly within 24 inches of this guy instead of 12. And seeing as he moves 10 inches, he's going to be using that heroic action to move an additional D6 inches up the board. This guy's going to be in combat and seeing as, seeing as he's pseudo immortal, he's going to just be murdering everything he sees. And then he's going to be giving plus one attack to everyone around him, including himself, which is nice. Then he has the Shroud Cage Fragment. At the start of the combat phase, subtract one from the bravery characteristic of each enemy unit within three inches of this unit until the end of the battle. Now, because the beginning, uh, at the start of the combat phase starts obviously multiple times through the game, that does mean people are reading this as, and quite rightly reading this as, that's going to be minus one bravery at the start of combat till the end of the battle, then again, another minus one bravery, then again, another minus one bravery, so you can effectively get a unit down to minus, you know, minus zero. Doesn't say to a minimum of one, and there isn't a core rule that you can never go into minus status on a, an ability, so you can never go to like minus five bravery, it stops at zero. However, I'm almost certain this will get FAQ'd and, and it's going to say till the end of the battle round, but it might not. And this might be an amazing ability. So I'll give you both options. If it's never FAQ'd and it stays the way it is, it's insane. It's insane. If it stays, if it's only till the end of the battle round, it's still fine. Like it's good. You have completely bananas and then fine. Those are your two options. Uh, however, there's an additional rule to this. If the result is higher than the bravery characteristic of that unit, the strike last effect applies to that unit until the end of the phase. This is amazing for this army. This army is fairly fragile, and it's probably going to want to charge multiple units at once. Having a unit, that is going to make it so that they strike last, and so you can chain activate in the right way, means you're going to do all of your damage first, 
ahead of them. That's very good. Now, we already know that there are other ways, like the Grim Garland, which reduces your bravery down by two, and a bunch of other ways to reduce the bravery of enemy units. So, reducing that bravery down so that everyone strikes last, so all of your combat smashes, is awesome. And that is, again, brilliant. Finally, uh, the King's Chalice, he has a 5-up ward. I've mentioned that already. However, in addition, in your hero phase, you can heal up to 2d3. Obviously, this is going to be on top of other healing, like heroic actions for healing, like the Chalice and other stuff, so he's just bonkers. He's brilliant. There's just no TLDR about this other than he's insane. It does require, like, well, not require, but... The reason he's very good, he's very good on his own, but the reason he's very good is he's the perfect support piece for all of the other units. Like I've said, your army wants to be fighting, so having everything strike last is very, very good. And then also giving everyone plus one attack in aura, reducing their bravery, all those things really stack up as a support piece. But his spell is amazing. Great. Really, really positive. He's pseudo-immortal. He's great in combat. Not insane, but great. Uh, to, great to brilliant, in my opinion. Uh, and the model's brilliant. So I would say that you're probably going to see him in most lists. He's like a kind of a catacross situation. Um, but yeah, I guess being insane is kind of the idea. But this is like an auto-buy if you want to play Flesh of Courts. And it's also a definite problem for everyone else in Age of Sigma right now. And honestly, I'm not really coming up with a solution other than, I guess, just charge everything into him and murder him. But he's only 400. I mean, it's four at ward. It's a great convo. I would love to know what you think about Usharan in the comments, in chat, and all those other things, because I think he's main. So this is our judge character. So get out your gavels and your wigs. He's got six wounds with a four-up armor save, and he moves six inches. And he has got some insane abilities. He's actually okay in a fight. Uh, four attacks, fours and threes, rend one, damage one. Uh, damage D3, sorry. And he is a abhorrent, which means that he is going to be able to resurrect whole units. That's going to be important when we talk about how he plays in the game in a moment. He's got a couple of abilities. The first one is Royal Blood. In your hero phase, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to this unit. This is kind of perfect because it means chip damage or like, you know, someone does a little bit of shooting or drops a mortal wound bomb on you or something from range. He's going to be able to heal that in each hero phase, so that's very nice. We love that a lot. Okay, his second ability is crazy. It's called Pronounce Judgment. In your hero phase, pick one of the following judgments to pronounce. The same unit cannot be affected by more than one judgment at the same time. Okay, first one is Petty Transgression. Pick one enemy unit that is visible to this unit and roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, add one to wound rolls for attacks made by friendly flesh eater courts units that target that unit until the end of the turn. Now, we have already got a couple of ways to get plus one to wound. Specifically, we get that, obviously, from a spell, which is genuinely quite nice. But this is also nice to get in another way of getting plus one to wound, which is good. It's not my favorite of all of them, but it's genuinely good. The next one is Dishonorable Conduct. In, uh, in battle, pick one enemy unit that is visible to this unit and more than three inches from all friendly units, Roll a dice on a 3+, plus. friendly flesh eater courts units can charge even if they ran earlier in the turn, as long as they finish that charge move within 0.5 inches of the enemy you pick. So basically, if they get into combat. This, to me, is easily... Uh, is this the best one? I think this is maybe the stronger one, especially early. And what's nice is this guy isn't key locked into a single tempo. He's going to be able to help you create tempo, which I think is important. Why this is so good is some of your units are slower, not very slow, but slower, specifically the uh, like Ushran, for example. So now that we pick an enemy unit, an Ushran is going to be able to auto run. Uh, six, a move 10, that's going to be 16 inches of movement. Hero phase, another D6, up to 22 inches of movement, and then charge is very, very fast. It's fast enough for him to engage in the first turn. But what's more important is that you can do this with all of your Flesh Eater Courts uh, army. Okay, that's important. You can do it with all of your Flesh Eater Courts army. And so, Everyone is going to be able to yeet themselves forward and attack something, which is very good. I like this one. I think this one is crazy strong. Um, it just makes it makes what was a mid-board combat army be a alpha army now. And that is very different tempo-wise. Super, super good. Next one, Grievous Insult. To the court, pick an enemy unit that's visible to this unit and within three inches of a friendly aberrant. Roll a dice on a three plus, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly flesh hit courts units that target that enemy unit until the end of the turn. 
So you're going to need an aberrant to be in combat with that unit before this becomes applicable. So this is going to be something you pick later in the battle. This doesn't say that it's restricted, though, to melee weapons, which means your shooting attacks, especially on your flares, are going to get plus one to hit. And they're going to get plus hit to plus one to hit for everyone, which is very, very good. Again, if it scales across all of the units, so awesome. Because you're targeting the enemy unit. So everything you have is going to go... Uh, into a unit. Finally, Regicide. Pick an enemy unit that is visible to this unit and has slain a friendly aberrant. Roll a dice and on a 3 plus until the end of that turn, add one to the damage characteristic of weapons used by friendly flesh eater quartz units that target that unit. You could, if you wanted to, take an aberrant and sacrifice that aberrant into the enemy so that they intentionally, you could charge in, let's say, a big monster. I don't know, let's pick Kragnos as an example. I decide I'm going to charge my aberrant at Kragnos on purpose so that the rest of my army gets plus one damage against him. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to do, and I guess killing your own characters to generate this might seem like a... a, a a very difficult kind of like combo to achieve but it's definitely there it's something that situationally is also a benefit as well but i really like this character it's 140 points for the grand justice core main and i think he's going to affect the army that you're playing with really well specifically because if you add him in you're going to be looking at a very fast very aggressive flesh eater course army the one negative is it does happen on threes it's not automatic or automatic so you are going to have to you know uh you're going to have to like be conscious that it's not necessarily going to pay off. And importantly, this is done in your hero phase. So before you decide to, decide to run and charge stuff, you're going to know ahead of time. So you've got some control. But 3+, plus, it's going to fail sometimes. You're going to lose some games because of it. I think he's great. The thing to also note about the Grand Justice Core main is that because he is an abhorrent hero, he is going to be a unit that's going to sit probably quite nicely inside your charnel throne and summon lots of deed points. And then... He's probably going to be the unit at the back of the board that's going to summon in uh, your units uh, that have died using that ability to use his D points to do so. It feels like an, an obvious answer. His ability has got infinite range. The summon or return a dead model has got infinite range as well. So it feels like he was built to literally sit on top of the throne and do this. So he, he works really well in that regard, and I think that that's, that's the most obvious answer. The next hero we're going to talk about is the Abhorrent Gore Warden. He's 150 points, 7 wounds with a 4-up save. He's the key guy. He flies, he's got some big old wings, and he's a wizard, can cast one spell and unbind one spell. Talking about his spell, he has a spell called Winds of Sheesh, and it's cast on a 6 in a range of 9 inches. If successfully cast, you pick a friendly flesh eater quartz unit that can fly and is wholly within range and visible to the caster. You can remove this unit and the unit picked up from the battlefield and set them up again more than nine inches from all enemy units, wholly within nine inches of each other. Neither unit can move in the following movement phase. Which is kind of good. A redeploy feels kind of nice. I don't think you're going to probably take this guy. Maybe you will. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about the opportunity cost of putting stuff in Deep Strike or even redeploying stuff. He has Royal Blood as an ability, which means he heals D3 in each hero phase, in the start of the hero phase, or in the hero phase, sorry. And he has the Royal, royal Hunting Party. Instead of setting up this unit on the battlefield, you can place it to one side and say that it's circling in the skies as a reserve unit. If you do so, when you would set up a friendly Crypt Flayer or Morbeg knights unit during deployment that unit could join this unit circling the skies as a reserve unit a maximum of one unit can join this unit it's important to know we haven't talked about it yet that there's going to be the ability to deploy this unit from deep strike so nine inches away from the enemy and then also move d6 inches forward from that deep strike normally when you deep strike you're always nine inches away and you've got to kind of like just deal with the charge of a nine inch sometimes you use a reroll. sometimes you get plus one uh, the reason that we saw so many doom balls obviously they fight a lot but most importantly they could be set up within seven inches of the enemy and they would get plus two to their charges so they had a five up uh re-rollable charge which is pretty good this means you're always going to be like eight inches away from your enemy because you're always going to get one on the D6, but you might go even further. There's also even more ways to kind of like uh, be gimmicky with uh, setting up reserve units and then also using the D6. We'll talk about that later. But because you do have those options, putting a unit in Deep Strike feels like a positive and other positives for putting units in Deep Strike, for instance, if you're playing a heavy shooting army, what you can do is you can put your valuable units, your Crypt Flares and your Morbang Knights, and you can obviously put them in the sky. So they're not going to get shot on the first turn or they're not going to get charged. So your opponent really struggles to choose an uh, a unit that it wants to go after 
because it's not on the board to hit. You get to decide when it's going to land. If you're set up for a priority roll coming up, you could land, charge, fight, win the priority roll, fight again. So you have this kind of like, you know, semi immortality, which is nice. It's a good tactic. Um, so it, it is very effective. However, the one thing I would say about this is that because of all those other like drop down mechanics, I'm not 100% certain that I would want to take this guy, um, in my personal opinion. Uh, but yeah, uh, because you can do, you've already got an incredibly fast army. As we've talked about, like literally a moment ago, you're going to be able to get, you're going to be able to get run and charge on an, on the army. So that's already very fast. Uh, you can. Uh, there are other ways to move units up the board, and some of the units just have fast movement profiles anyway. There's a spell for plus two to move. So putting stuff in deep strike doesn't really seem like it's, it could be super useful, but it could definitely like, and also makes your opponent's box in. I've talked about deep strike way too much here. I think he definitely sees play in some lists but and he's not bad but because you have other options you're not necessarily having to take him also if he's your general he's going to make morbeg knights battle line which means you can buff up to have a large unit of nine knights which is awesome and definitely some people are going to do that. The next unit is the Abhorrent Arc Regent, a staple of Flesh Eater Court's armies uh, in the previous book. Pretty good in this one. Seven wounds with a four-up save, pretty tanky, and has got the ability to heal D3 wounds in each of your hero phases. So again, chip damage is not going to do a lot to this character. It's got five attacks in close combat, threes and threes, rend one damage two, which is genuinely okay, and you can go and fight like 10-person screens or you know pre-game move units, that sort of thing. And is a two cast wizard, a two cast wizard for 150 points. Let's go. Okay. Very, very good. Okay. Very good. And then he's got two abilities, two more abilities for 150 points. Countless servants at the start of your hero phase, you can return up to three slain models to a friendly serfs unit. So that's going to be ghouls or crypt guard within 18 inches of this unit, or you can return one slain uh, knight model to unit within 18 inches of this unit. And that's not bad. That's up to four wounds into a Crypt Horror unit or a Morbeg Knight unit is three wounds, actually. But like, you know, or a Flare unit, that's good. For free is Ace. Means you're not using any of your deeds points as well. But you could also use your deed points as well, which is fun, because he's an abhorrent, which means you're going to be able to return models back from the dead, which is great. Then you have a carry and call okay uh oh sorry the heal, heal is only within not even wholly within <laughs> sorry i don't normally unprofessionally laugh during my youtube videos but someone needed to proofread this book okay uh and now the uh the best bit about this uh the the best thing about the abhorrent hark region is carry and call which is a spell that he's able to cast which is cast on a six if successfully cast in the following movement phase, friendly Flesh Eater Quartz units that are set up at the end of the movement phase can immediately move D6 inches. Now, as we've already discussed, you can put units in Deep Strike. When also you return slain models from combat, they have to be wholly within six inches of the board edge, not from combat. When you return slain models using your deed points, so, you know, there's a slain unit that's been murdered. We've talked about this already. You bring that unit back, it has to be wholly within six inches of the board edge, nine inches away from the enemy. Then that's a setup. And because it's a setup, you're going to be able to move D6 inches after. Okay. And then the way you can, if you really want to like, you know, mix all this together is you can set up the unit at half strength, start to heal that unit as well, and then move that unit D6 inches. And because you can heal that unit closer to the unit, so imagine putting a base, like a kind of conga line forward, that means you can just have that dead unit at close to full strength, if not full strength, move right next to the opponent within three inches, then charge, which is very good. Very good. This also doesn't have a range, carry and call, and also, in addition, affects all units on the board. All units on the board. It's just like a nebulous, just do what you like. Do, just very much like the Pope. Just do what you like. It, tell you what, it's good to be a king. That's what I say. Uh, 150 points. I think you're going to see a lot of people take this guy. Again, kind of the conversation I had previously. 150 points when, um, you know, you could be taking more actual bodies on the board. You could be taking more units. You probably definitely want some heroes for deeds and other stuff. He definitely will see play. I think people will be using that gimmick a lot. Um, it's obviously a gimmick that's intended because it's written in very specifically, which is very scary. Uh, so, 
yeah, very good. Very, very good. Very interesting. Uh, I, I think you'll see him see play a lot. The next unit is an abhorrent ghoul king. 130 points for one of these guys. He's just a you know a character on foot. Six wounds, four up save. Medium combat profile of five attacks, threes and threes, rend one damage two. But he is a wizard. So a character that can generate deed points for 130 points. That's very cheap. That is also an abhorrent. Uh, sorry, yes, an abhorrent. Uh, and then also he's going to heal D3 at the beginning of each hero phase is very effective. So let's just talk about that. A wizard for 130 points that can fight and heal D3, has six wounds of the four-up save is great. Okay, start there. At the start of the combat phase, he's got an ability called Code of Honor, which is the start of the combat phase. You can pick an enemy hero within an inch of this unit and say it will duel. If you do so, add one to the damage characteristics. It will go up to damage three of this unit's melee weapons until the end of the phase, but it can only target the enemy hero. Then you have Unnatural Speed, which is his spell. It's cast on a six, and if successfully cast, this unit can immediately attempt to charge, and you can roll 3d6 for the charge roll. If the charge roll is successful, the strike first effect applies to this unit in the following combat phase. So this is very fun. So you can unnatural speed at the enemy and then fight something, which is kind of cool. Especially if you've got a unit that's like blocking up your units. Like, but he's not going to do tons of damage, so it's kind of weird. So why would you want to do it? Well, maybe you would want to do it so that he could become kind of your uh, your your suicide abhorrent ghoul king. So that the judge, because he's a ghoul king that will have been killed, your judge is going to be able to make it so that you can do plus one to wound on a unit. And for 130 points, that feels like a good combo to attempt to achieve. Throw this guy in, get him murdered, and then get plus one damage against that unit that murdered him. Very good. And your opponent doesn't get a lot of choice about who you charge and stuff. So, very fun. Very fun. Very interesting. For 130 points, like, he's just a bargain. If he's doing anything for 130 points versus casting a Mystic Shield, which is all wizards do at around the 100-point mark, he's amazing. So, go him. Our next unit is the Abhorrent Cardinal, the Bone Pope. He's got five wounds and a four-up save. And he's not good in combat, but he's a priest. You wouldn't expect him to be. You'd expect him to be creepy. Uh, he can attempt to chant one prayer in the chanting phase. In your hero phase, you can heal up to D3 Three wounds allocated to this unit with the royal blood ability. And obviously, he is a abhorrent, so he can obviously resurrect units. Uh, in his prayer, uh, he's got a prayer, and his prayer is speak in tongues. Uh, it's a prayer that's a value, a casting value of four. So it's t more difficult to cast and a range of 18 inches. You pick an enemy unit, and then uh, each time you try to do a command ability on that, on a four plus, the command has no effect. So that's a four plus. I personally think that that's okay. Like in the right situation, it's going to work really, really well. But I'm in love with the prayer that you get from the prayer law where you're going to be able to heal. You pick a unit and then any one of those models that die, you can heal units around it. That feels, well, you can, it can heal models around it, which is very good if you're taking a lot of monsters or bigger models. I feel that's very effective. So I like that. And I think that's probably why you take the Abhorrent Cardinal. And he's only 120 points. So that feels very effective as well. But you can obviously skip him by just taking the artifact that makes you a priest, which makes the most sense. And then you can have that on one of your wizards. So one of your wizards, oh, no, actually, no, I don't think you can do that. But either way, you're going to want that prayer, I think. Uh, we'll do all the combos at the end of the video. But 120 points is a great value, very cheap and very effective. The next unit is the Marrow Scroll Herald. He's 100 points, let me tell you. It's a bargain in anyone's world. Importantly, he's a courtier. And that's where we start to get into the really spicy part of life. Specifically because we can take the command trait, which is going to make it so that we can use, uh, we can uh, reduce how much it costs to return models into units. That's what a courtier does, as opposed to resurrect units, which is what all of the uh, other units, we've, all the other heroes we've been talking about recently do. He's got five wounds and a five-up save, and don't forget the classic six-up ward for the whole army. Um, and obviously, if he's near some crypt guards, it's going to be a five-up ward. Now, he's got two abilities, and one's very complex, but I want to talk about the first one, the, the second one first, and then we'll talk about the other one. He has an ability called Don't Shoot the Messenger which is this unit is not visible to enemy models while it's wholly within six inches of five or more other friendly flesh eat corpse models. So of course you could already use Crypt Guard to bodyguard him to increase his ward save, screen him, but also make him impossible to be shot. 
which feels very good. Like, that feels very good. You can't target him with spells, and there's a bunch of abilities you can't get to him. Obviously, something that does AoE damage is still going to hit him, like Syrian White Light or a Knight of Alexa. Those are things are all going to be that effective at taking him out. But the reason this becomes quite important, but because he's a courtier, he's going to be able to return slain models into units. So you can have him sit kind of safely behind maybe some frontline combatants they're not going to be able to take out your support piece and you're going to be able to res models back into them which is very very effective and that command trait that we talked about where knight models can return back for only one deed does mean that quite nicely this guy when he does his he's going to do his heroic action and get d3 points maybe or whatever he's going to get back however many points he's going to get back from his heroic action to get more deed points he's going to do a prayer because we're going to make him a priest he's going to get another deed so if he gets three or four deeds he's going to return three or four knights three or four more beg knights three or three or more flayers horrors any of those things <sighs> It's very good. It's very good. And the interactivity with your opponent is very difficult to manage because your opponent is going to struggle to get at this character because you're going to have bodies in the way. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. So he's excellent, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, 100 points because of Don't Shoot the Messenger. In addition to that, you have a very high skill cap ability, which is actually really fun, really, really fun, called the King's Entreaty. At the end of the charge phase, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and say this unit will offer the infected bone no jokes in the chat, please. <laughs> the important part is this is an enemy unit within three inches. So you are going to have to charge this guy in. He's literally going to have to run in and send the message. So this is a much more interactive than some of the spells and abilities we've seen previously, which have been bored wide and haven't required your opponent to involve themselves. So, you you know, it's good. And if you do so, your opponent must choose whether that enemy accepts or refuses the bone. A question I ask myself daily. If he refuses uh, the strike first, if he refuses the bone, the strike first effect, who wrote this? Like a child. Whoever wrote it, genius. Love him. If he refuses the bone, the strike first effect applies to friendly flesh eater courts units within three inches of this unit until the end of the following combat phase. Okay? But if you accept that, and obviously that's great. Like I've said, you've got lots of models charging in, doing damage, etc. Then uh, also, as Painted Orcs points out, it's a really good point. If he gets charged, you could also offer them the bone. You don't have to go and make them take the bone. If they do accept the bone, though, that enemy unit becomes infected. And for the rest of the battle, roll 2d6 before an infected unit issues or receives a command, attempts to cast a spell or chants a prayer. Make a roll before the action is carried out. And if the roll is greater than the unit's bravery characteristic, that unit cannot perform that action that phase. This is obviously awesome into low bravery armies awesome don't forget as we talked about earlier there's also ways to stack loads of bravery debuffs in this army as well so if you were building this army book has got so many options so many ways to play so many stackable synergies that you can really play into all of them is so good however you can reduce the um bravery of units around it so you can definitely make that be even scarier you know which is which is good as well very good. He's got lots of options. I would say don't like in the build that's egregious with all of the other abilities that are egregious. Don't shoot the messenger works really well. However, the king's entreaty, the bone, uh, is actually a really high skill cap play where you can build army lists that synergize it with it really nicely. You can be like you know using flares to teleport him, drop him down, move d6 thanks to the arcs region. So do a setup, move d6, do a charge. You know, there's some real nice options here. So you have a lot of play with this character, and it really does showcase the sheer level of like mixing and matching of synergies you can do. It's a big brain play, which is funny for an army that really doesn't have a lot of brains. Well, Capitator, and he has taken my head. <laughs> anyway, he's 100 points, and he's got five wounds and a five-up save, so big yikes, probably going to die. Okay, and he's got Headman's Axe attack, which is three attacks, if obviously he's got the Feeding Frenzy, going to be four attacks, let's go. Four attacks, um, fours and threes, Ren two, damage three. Now... Don't forget, you could obviously, you might be able to give him flame weapon, all sorts of stuff. There's two things that we need to talk about. Number one, he's got executions entourage. In the combat phase, after this unit has fought for the first time in that phase, you can pick a friendly service unit and you can fight at the same time as them. This is kind of a classic hero, does a hero thing, fights at the same time as unit. Kind of leading from the front, it's a nothing ability. What is a great ability is off with their head. 
which please do remember he has this ability on a hundred point ghoul with some rubbish axe he found and a bloodthirster does not have this ability at the end of the combat phase if any wounds caused by this unit's headsman axe in that phase were allocated to an enemy hero and that enemy hero has not been slain roll a five plus and that hero is slain now this is awesome the potential to just murder a giant monster just chop his head off like a vampire lord zombie dragon just get him wrecked there is a bit of a problem in that obviously he probably is going to get murdered back because he has a rubbish save um <laughs> he's probably not going to survive but there is a way um yeah, he's fine he's fine and you could do some incredibly fun stuff with this i mean if you took four of these guys that's only going to be 400 points and you'd just be running around this is exactly the kind of stuff I want from units in this game. And this is great. And it's not necessarily like tournament effective, but you have the opportunity to do really fun stuff in the game, which is very much like the Marrow Scroll Herald as well, with the bone, offering the bone, not giving a bone. You've got loads of really great abilities there to do some really fun stuff with. So actually, I'm super... Uh, yeah, this is great. Really good. The next unit is the Crypt Gas Courtier, but he is just there. He's 100 points, and honestly, I'm just going to move on because the thing I want to talk about is the Vargulf Courtier. He's 165 points with eight wounds with a four up save. And I need to be clear, eight wounds isn't loads of wounds. So he definitely can just die. He's a courtier though, and definitely uh, definitely probably going to be, or could be a general so that you can bring knights back for only one deed versus six. Okay, 165 points, four up save, moves 10 inches, is a courtier. Now, what rules does he have? Well... He's got five attacks in close combat that are threes and threes rend one damage two, which is nice. And then one attack that's threes and twos minus two damage three. Don't forget, of course, with Feeding Frenzy, you're going to get plus one attack to those profiles anyway, which is quite nice. Plus one to hits, fairly easy to get in this army, and plus one to wound. So most of that could be twos and twos. Let's talk about the abilities. He's got King's Champion. At the start of the combat phase, you can say this unit will use this ability. If you do so in that phase, you can add two attacks to the characteristic of this unit's melee weapons. So that's both melee weapons. It can only target units that have a wound characteristic of one or two and does not have a mount. So it definitely isn't going to work into like a big hero monster, but it is going to work into, you know, infantry and other stuff. And don't forget, generating deeds in melee is one of the ways to more quickly generate deeds. And because he's a courtier, you probably want to generate lots of deed points so you can heal heal models back into units and the fact that with plus two attacks on his melee profiles and feeding frenzy he is going to have eight attacks that are damaged two and four attacks that are damaged three is very good that's all i'm gonna say very very good but it doesn't end there he has bounding strides when this unit makes a move it can pass across terrain features in the same manner as a model that can fly which is fine and where it gets super spicy is victory feast at the end of the combat phase if an enemy models were slain by wounds caused by this unit in that phase you can heal d6 wounds allocated to this model and that's at the end of the combat phase which is good so you get hit like and he's close to dying d6 back however there's more in addition at the end of the combat phase so as long as he survives combat this unit can immediately retreat and he moves 10 inches and because he moves over units, he, so this is just how I picture him working, runs in, wipes out a screen, and then immediately retreats. Then sets himself up with his six deed points, which he's already generated for himself, and then is set up to heal five to six knights back into a unit of flayers or horrors. Amazing. 165 points. Insane stuff, right? He could have run and charge. Yes, there's a spell, obviously, so he's got... Uh, no, I don't know if that spell will affect him because I think it requires you to have seven or less wounds. Um, but he definitely can have run and charge, which is very good as well. Uh, if you would like to have that, there's lots of pluses to hit. There's lots of pluses to wound. Amazing, amazing. I, you, I haven't seen this YouTube because obviously I record this while I'm streaming with Twitch and we kind of record the bits out so that you guys get a more succinct video. But I laugh for a good five minutes when I read this, this is bananas. <laughs> it's so good. Like if I was like, if you bought that bought box, I was like, this guy looks rubbish when I looked at the box, but now I'm like, this guy is so good. So he's great. Next unit is the Crypt Infernal Courtier. It's got six wounds with a four up save and moves 12 inches. Now he is a hybrid unit in that he's got a shooting attack and also a melee attack. And don't forget he's a courtier. And 
he is a great force multiplier. So his shooting attack is fetid breath. It's 10 inches and he moves 12 inches. So he's got a 22 inch effective range. He it hits on a four, it wounds on a three, and it's Ren two and it's D3 damage. It's really important to note that, that profile because it's going to affect his main ability. So four attacks, obviously you can give it plus one to hit. Um, wounds on a three, there are ways to get plus one to wound. Ren two, which is pretty good, and D3 damage. Okay. And then in combat, he's got five attacks that hit on fours, wound on threes, and a damage two. He can fly, which is decent, but this is the main thing. He has the mind-shattering cacophony, which is what I felt when I read the rule. If an enemy model uh, is slain with wounds caused by his fetid breath, which is sh his shooting attack, until the end of that phase, add one to the damage characteristic of missile weapons used by friendly Crypt Flayers units while they're wholly within nine inches of this unit. The same Crypt Flayers cannot benefit from this ability more than once. An important note to make is that the Crypt Flayers do not have to target the same unit. They just have to be within range of this unit so that does mean that this unit is going to be so he can target i don't know a screen and then a unit of crit flares or several units of crit flares located around the court here are all going to get plus one damage and they can shoot at other units which is very good i personally think you're going to see crit flare builds because they have four shots each and uh, they're only damage one but four shots each that become damage two and if you would have nine of them you can have 36 shots damage too which is so very good uh i think i think he is going to be the basis of some very aggressive shooting builds for these guys i would definitely look at that if i were you try and build into that i think that's fun so the crypt haunted courtier is our next character is the big it's the crypt horror basically that's the character and he's got six wounds and a four up save moves seven inches 140 points Five attacks in close combat, hits on a four, wounds on a three, Ren two, damage three, so very good. And then it's got noble blood, so it can be uh, heal up to D3 in each hero phase. He's got the knightly retinue, which means this character can fight at the same time as a crypt horror unit wholly within nine inches. Now, it's been pointed out to me that what's nice about this is it means he can go into combat, fight, and he can generate six deed points, which automatically is going to activate the ability for the Crypt Horrors near him to get plus one attack, which is quite nice. I quite like that. That's very good. That's a nice reason to take him. I think I prefer the Vargulf myself or multiple Vargulfs over the Crypt Horn to Courtier because he's faster, um, he heals more, he's got a retreat. Uh, but this guy is definitely better into a more generalist kind of like army if it's not into infantry. So the Vargulf is much better into infantry. So I think I prefer the Vargulf or even multiple Vargulfs, to be honest. But the Crypt Horn Courtier is good. Fight at the same time, it's kind of cool. Uh, that's what he does. Now we've done with all the support characters, it's time to go back to the big hitters. And we're starting with maybe one of the biggest hitters in the game, the Abhorrent Ghoul King on Royal Terrorgeist. A terrifying terrifying model in the last edition of the game even scarier now well he can't fight twice now so that's kind of good he's got 16 wounds with a four up armor save and moves 14 inches so very very fast don't forget we've also got the opportunity for running charges available in this army uh, and then his bravery 10 60 wounds four up saves got a six up ward save don't forget and if you take crypt guard five up ward save can fly and is a wizard the important thing to talk about with this model is oh, two things, really. He's got the Death Streak ability, and he's also got a Fanged Maw. So his melee profile is Fanged Maw has got three attacks at three-inch range. Fours and threes, Ren 2, damage D6. However, if you roll a six to hit, then you are going to do... Uh, yes, it's one if I hit roll, then you are going to do six mortal wounds. But you've only got three attacks. Unless, of course... Of course, you are underneath uh, the fr the frenzy, uh, and then it's going to be four attacks. And we'll talk about mount traits in a minute, but there's another way to add this. Okay, and then he's a wizard, a level one wizard, and it's worth talking about the fact he has a spell called Ferocious Hunger, which is cast on a six in a range of 12 inches, and pick a friendly Terrorgeist, which is him. And then uh, holding in range, you can reroll hit rolls for attacks made by the Fanged Moor. So with the Mount Trait, plus one attack on the Fanged Moor. Um, feeding Frenzy, plus one attack. We're going to have five attacks. Rerolling to hit, any sixes to hit do six mortal wounds flat. So I think it averages about six to 12 mortal wounds each combat phase, which is very good. Uh, if it doesn't do that, though, it's Ren 2 damage D6. Skeletal Talons starts as seven attacks that do damage two. And then the glory, uh, gory talons are four attacks, which are also damage too. Don't forget, you can also obviously have plus one. Uh, no, feeding frenzies. 
Feeding frenzy actually isn't going to affect the fang more, I don't think. I don't think it affects mounts. So something I'll have to look at, actually. So I might be wrong. Um, but you definitely could have plus one attack from the mount trait, which is good. And you can reroll to hit, which is also good as well. Other rules that this unit has is the Death Streak ability. Uh, do not use the attack sequence for an attack maybe this unit's Death Streak. Instead, roll a dice and add Death Streak value on this unit's damage table. If the total is higher than the target unit's bravery characteristic, the target unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the difference between its bravery characteristic and the total. Death Streak starts, as, Death Streak, sorry, starts at a six. So I add a D6. Statistically, it's a three, so that's nine. So on a normal bravery, seven or eight, I'm going to do one or two more wounds. But for already low bravery units, this is a nightmare. And in addition to this, this is where it gets really scary, we can reduce the bravery of enemy units down with the rules that are in this book. Therefore, you can get the bravery very low and you can do a lot of mortal wounds out of this, which is very, very, very good. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Just very good. Uh, so that's, again, a source of a great amount of mortal wounds. If this unit is destroyed, you're going to suffer D3 mortal wounds to units within three inches. It's kind of fine. You don't want your unit to die, so you don't care. And in your hero phase, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to this unit, which is nice. In addition to, obviously, the prayer we talked about earlier, which is going to do lots of healing, which is nice. Or the chalice of Ushran, which is also going to do lots of healing. I definitely think there's a monster build. Uh, the Ushran Chalice, one of these guys just monster mashing it forward. Uh, very difficult to deal with. They're probably, it's a little bit more janky the way that they heal. It's a little bit less reliable. It requires endless spells and prayers to go off. So it's not quite as good as Double Dragon from uh, from Soblight Grave Lords with the hunger, but it definitely has got the opportunity to do a lot of healing, which I think is very good. This guy, uh, we should talk about the mount traits. So you have mount traits available for the Royal Terrorgeist, and this is Gruesome Bite is one of the mount traits you could have. You get one free mount trait in your army. Add one to the attack characteristic of Fang more. You're going to take that every time. Horribly resilient, this unit's Royal Blood ability, so where you heal D3 is 2D3. It's quite nice, but you're going to take the Fang more. And Morbeg Swiftness, this unit can retreat and still charge, which I would say is normally amazing. But you're going to take plus one attack on the Fang more because the ability to do six mortal wounds is awesome, and you're going to do that all the time. He's great. He's really good. Um, he doesn't. He's the same points as Ushran though, and Ushran buffs the army a lot and is a combat monster. This guy is just a singular point and click combat monster. It's whether or not you really need that, or maybe you want to do kind of like a double monster build. Either way, our final big hero on a monster is the Abhorrent Ghoul King on Royal Zombie Dragon for 440 points. 16 wounds with a four up save is a wizard with a spell that lets uh, monsters wholly within 18 inches of the caster run and charge. It's a lot of points to spend for run and charge when you can already get... I mean, if you were running lots of dragons anyway, I guess this is a thing. If you wanted to do an all-monster mash army, because you can take zombie dragons and terror guys together. Not personally what I'd do, but there you go. You can do it. He's got a shooting attack, which is kind of good. D6 shots. Threes and threes. Render one damage three. Damage three! That's so good. Uh, you know, if you did spike, that would be really good. Um, but... I'm not taking that for 440 points. And then he's got like just an okay melee profile. He can heal D3 wounds in the hero phase and probably quite importantly, enemy units cannot receive the Inspiring Presence command while they're within three inches of any friendly units with this ability. Now that's quite nice. That is quite nice. Uh, but you do generate deeds by slaying models. So I don't know if you want units to necessarily run away. You are going to be lower in bravery, so that's good. So you can definitely do some really fun stuff there. Lower bravery, make units run away because they can't inspire in presence. I quite like that. That's quite fun. Um, but overall, he's not Ushran, which buffs all of the all of your units in your army. And he's just so good. And he's also not the absolute monster that is a good king on terror guys for doing all the damage. So probably not for me. There are three mount traits Three mount traits for zombie dragons. First is Baneful Breath, which is going to improve the Pestilence Breath ability by one. So it's going to be Ren 2. Damage 3 is pretty great. Uh, Death from the Skies. Instead of setting this unit on the battlefield, you can put it in Deep Strike. And at the end of the movement phase, or your first movement phase, sorry, you must set up this unit on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units. And then you've got the Venerated Zombie Dragon. Add one to hit rolls for friendly flesh eater courts monsters while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. So everyone can get plus one to hit. So you can run a bunch of monsters, some zombie dragons, some terror guys, and send it all in, which is kind of cool. I like that a lot. That's quite fun. Um, 
but like I don't know. Like I feel like there's going to be so many attacks that you can generate extra attacks on. You can do other stuff in this army. I'm not necessarily certain. Just some big monsters are going to overly work. Uh, but yeah, sure. With a prayer and also with a chalice, you're definitely going to be able to heal a lot of these monsters a lot of the time. So having a lot of monsters feels like it's going to be really good. So uh, the battle line unit are Crypt Ghouls. They come in 20 models. It's a unit of 20, and they cost 160 points. They're one wound each, and they've only got a six up save. So they're very, very fragile. But what they make up for fragile is... A million attacks. That's what they make up for. Uh, that's how they make up for it. There's a champion that adds plus one to the attacks, so you get a million attacks plus one, which is nice. And they have two cool abilities. Number one, they have Boundless Ferocity. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by this unit is a six, that attack automatically wounds the target. Do not make a wound roll. If this unit has 20 or more models, unmodified hit rolls of five or six automatically wound the target, which is good. We already talked about the ways that there is so much opportunity to do a lot of recursion into this unit. You can put a lot of bodies back into Crypt Ghouls, especially using the Chalice of Ushran. So getting back up to your 20 feels like it's quite easy. They have two attacks base, but if they have Feeding Frenzy, obviously, they're going to add plus one attack. It's very easy to get plus one to hit and plus one to wound in uh, Flesh Eater Courts. So you could very easily have, for 160 points, 60 attacks, threes and threes. Now, damage one, no rend. They do gain rend if they have royal approval. Improve the rend characteristics of this unit's belly weapons by one, while it's within nine inches of courtiers or at 18 inches of friendly aberrants. But you could also cast Hoar Frost on these guys. And honestly, the idea of 60 attacks, threes and threes, rend three, damage one, is scary and i can't believe that that's the battle line unit that's a lot if you want to double up the size of that unit for no particular reason at all that i can imagine i think there's probably one reason i can imagine and the fact that you can bring this unit back to half strength and then resummon them is very good run and charge move six inches but they've got run and charge potentially plus one to wound as discussed before and then like i've said a unit of 40 is going to be 120 attacks i don't know what to tell you that's crazy stuff. So, Crypt Ghouls, ghoulish. The next unit we're going to look at are the Crypt Guard, and these come in units of 10 and are 140, 140 points. They will be battle line if you play in the Morgan sub faction. And these have got some very cool rules uh, a one wound each with a five up save, but they also have a five up ward save. And as I've been saying through most of this video, they also add one to the ward rolls for friendly Flesh Eater Courts heroes wholly within three inches of this hero. So because most of your units have a six up ward save thanks to the battle trait, that means many of your heroes can have a five up ward save, which is quite nice. Right now, it's under consideration as whether or not Ushran is going to be able to get in range of it and get a four up ward save. He might not be able to get close enough because his base is quite big and you have to be wholly within three inches of this unit. So currently up for debate. In the comments, let me know where we ended up on that. If you're watching this a few months later, there definitely will be a conclusion right now. I'll write that. I'll pin that in the comments at the top of the video. Okay, but other than that, they've got some cool stuff. There's only 10 models, so the two attacks each is threes and threes, rend one, damage one. Isn't anywhere near as scary as uh, our ghoul friends. Uh, but obviously with um, Feeding Frenzy, that could be three attacks. So 30 attacks out of a unit of 10 is pretty nice. And there are 140 points. They have a special rule called the Armory of Madness. Any, if any wounds caused by this unit's attacks are allocated to an enemy unit, that enemy unit cannot issue or receive commands until the end of the turn. Now, that's not going to be that uh, important because um, this is done, obviously, in the combat phase. So that means you're just not going to be able to use Inspire and Presence. But that means you don't have to be in a zombie dragon. You could just... Charge him with the unit of Crypt Guard, do a couple of wounds, and no Inspiring Presence until the end, like it's not till the end of the turn. Because it's done in the combat phase, the only thing that's going to happen is the Battle Shock phase, and that'll be it, which is good. Uh, there's a musician who adds plus one to run and charge rolls, which is good, especially if you get off run and charge. This makes the movement six, uh, you know, effectively movement nine, which is good. Uh, Standard Bearer halves the number of units that run away from Battle Shock. They're Bravery 10, so that's quite nice. So even less units are going to run away. And the Crypt Champion adds plus one to the attacks. These feel very good. It's 140 points to add a lot of utility to your army. So you're not necessarily going to have loads of these guys. You might. You might have a couple here and there. Um, if they work with Ushan, you might be trying to make that work. Uh, if they 
like if they, but you probably want to protect some of those smaller characters to keep them alive and the crypt guard are going to be really great for that next we're going to talk about the royal beast flares and this is actually an amazing unit it's 115 points it's the warcry warband with the ghoul rillers 115 points and you get 10 models but one of them is a royal beast flare and he's got three wounds then you have two ghoul rillers and they are two wounds apiece then you have seven normal ghouls totaling 14 wounds on this unit 14 wounds for 115 points is not bad they have a five hour armor save so they're not very tanky but don't forget all of the units i've been talking about so far can get a five up ward save which we talked about previously now they have some special abilities they have the hunter's instincts enemy monsters within three inches of this unit cannot carry out monstrous rampages and in addition reduce the damage characteristic of weapons used by enemy monsters by one while they're within three inches of any friendly units with this ability to a minimum of one it's actually really good and if you this shuts down mega gargants as an army not forgetting if you had the delusion for plus one to wound against them that's pretty great um it shuts down uh frost lords on stone horns really effectively this is legitimately really really good and then they have awful hounds while this unit includes any awful hands add two inches to the move characters if his unit while it's within 18 inches of a monster so it can be move eight they're also serfs so you're going to be able to return models to the unit as well which is really good. And obviously, if this unit dies, you're going to be able to bring it back and heal it back. But the attack profile is legit awesome. And if you were to take a unit of 20, we'll talk about a unit of 10, we'll talk about buffing it up. So the sharpened teeth and claws, which um, I think seven of the models have, um, ends up being two attacks each, fours and fours, no rend damage one. That's not much to write home, home about. But the hunting pole arm with the Royal Flame Master, so one model, is two attacks, threes and threes, rend one, Damage three. The fearsome fangs and claws, which are on the gorillas, of which there are two, are three attacks each, so six attacks for the unit. Fours and threes rend one, damage two. But don't forget, we can have feeding frenzy to add plus one attack to all of these things. We can also do plus one to hit and plus one to wound, and we can reinforce the unit. So let's talk about a unit of 20 of these guys with feeding frenzy. We're going to end up with six attacks on the hunting pole arm. Twos and twos, rend one, this, if we haven't put Hoarfrost on them, damage three. Then we're going to end up with 16 attacks, threes and twos, rend one, damage two from the Fearsome Fangs. And all of that only for 225 points, shutting down en en enemy monstrous rampages. I don't necessarily think you need to. I'm not sure if it's hyper efficient, but it's an amazingly cool unit. And I think probably the math on ghouls ends up being better, especially as you need those for battle line anyway. But these are really good. Royal Beast Flares, 100% would go into my basket. And I would definitely try to play with them as well. They're very good. The next unit we're going to talk about are Crypt Flares. You, they come as a unit of three, and they're 140 points, 160 points, sorry, for three. They've got four wounds each with a five-up armor save, which is not that survivable. Uh, you know, that's only going to be uh, 12 wounds, but they do move 12 inches, and their shooting attack is 10 inches for an effective 22-inch uh, threat range. And that's the first thing we should talk about. They fly, and they this uh, so that's they're going to be quite mobile and that shooting attack has got four attacks each so that's going to be 12 across the unit hitting on fours wound on threes rend two damage one but as we talked about previously you're going to be able to stack that with the crypt court uh, the courtier the flare courtier so that that's going to be damage two so you potentially are going to do a ton of these and i definitely think Two units of six of these are going to be busted as all hell. They're also knights. So if you were to take them in the sub-faction where you get plus one damage on the charge, um, then you can have the piercing talons attack, which are four attacks each, four threes, rend one damage, one to be damage two, which is pretty good. Now they've got a couple of abilities. Death Scream is add one to wound rolls for attacks made by Death Scream if uh, the target unit has a bravery characteristic of six or less. So if you do lower the enemy unit's bravery down, you are going to be able uh, to make it so you wound on twos and obviously with an all-out attack or some of the other sources of plus one to hit, you're going to be able to be threes and twos on a lot of crit flare shooting attacks. These are going to be so good. I can't express the numbers on it. I haven't done the numbers yet. Watch out for another stream or a video where I do this, but it's going to be so high then you got escort courtiers which is a super cool ability 
When you pick this unit to move in the movement phase, you can pick one friendly flesh eater quartz hero that has a wounds characteristic of seven or less that cannot fly and that is wholly within three inches of this unit. If you do so, remove that hero from the battlefield. After this unit is finished moving, set up that hero wholly within three inches of this unit and more than three inches from all enemy units. This is really good way of getting your on foot characters from the back of the board to the front of the board, especially as uh, the courtier characters are gonna want to be healing these knight models. These, this is also a unit that can become battle line in the Blisterkin sub-faction, so you can have a unit of nine, and also their knight models, so you're going to take two points or two deeds to be able to heal one back into a unit, and take, unless you take that command trait, which everyone's going to take, uh, where you can heal multiple of these back as well. I think Crypt Flayers in this book are an 11 out of 10, thanks to all of the buffs that you can put on these guys. They might be one of the scariest units in the game right now. Uh, honestly, 160 points, and they are fragile, but you know, if you wipe the unit out, you can just put the whole unit back on the board as discussed earlier. And so, do you really care that the whole unit gets wiped out? I'm not really sure. <laughs> it's really good. Two turns of shooting from this with the plus one damage, and then when they charge in and they get plus one damage, I feel like these are going to go through most things in the game. The only thing is the rend is fairly low, I guess. Combat, it's only rend one. Shooting, it's rend two. So very, very good. Love it, loads. The next unit is truly horrifying. It's the Crypt Horrors. They come as a unit of three. They are four wounds apiece with a five-up save, and they cost 130 points. They move seven inches, but we've already talked about all the ways you can make units move, run and charge, plus two to move, a bunch of other stuff. They have got a two-inch reach on their two-inch reach on their weapons. They're not battle line, but you can take them in the sub faction Morgans, uh, I think, or whichever one it is, uh, and they become battle line. So when they become battle line, you can have them up to a unit of nine, obviously. They have got four attacks each with their clubs and septic talons, and they hit on a four, wound on a three, and a rend nothing damage two. They add plus one rend if they're within nine inches of courtiers or uh, an abhorrent, 18 inches of an abhorrent. And they ha can heal up to D3 because they have noble blood in your hero phase, which is kind of okay. Um, don't forget, you can obviously also... They've got a 5-up armor save, so they're fairly squishy. You can put a 5-up ward save on them as well, Mystic Shield. You can make them a little bit survivable, but it's definitely fair to say that they're not survivable because of that 5-up armor save, but there are ways to make them more survivable. But what they are is insanely killy. Super killy. So they have a rule called Warrior Elite. If the unmodified wound roll for an attack made with a club and septic talent is a 6, the weapon has a damage characteristic of 3 instead of 2 for that attack. Okay, not a problem. Now let's do some other math, shall we? Uh, which is really nice. In the sub-faction where they're battle line, because they're knight models, on the charge, they get plus one damage to their melee weapons. So immediately they become damage three. Now, the basics of that is, it, if we also murder a ghoul king and we use the prayer that we talked about earlier, they could be damage four. With any sixes to hit being Damage five. Thank you. Hollow Morn is the sub faction uh, where they become battle line. And if we have Feeding Frenzy, they can have five attacks each as opposed to four attacks each. So let's just do those simple things. Uh, let's just let's not kill the Ghoul King, taking them up to damage five, because I think that becomes a little bit silly. But instead, let's just focus on the fact that we can charge and we can have plus one to our damage. So that means a unit of nine is going to have 45 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on twos, rend one if we're within range of a courtier or an abhorrent, and then they're going to be damage three, and any sixes uh, to wound are going to be damage four. That's a very, very killy unit. There's also quite a lot of wounds as well. That's going to be 36 wounds on a five up save. You can give them a five up ward save and it's going to be crazy cheap. It's only going to cost you 390 points. Only going to cost you 390 points. Now, there are some support characters to create that combination, of course, but they're very, very good. And if the unit does get wiped out, you can bring the whole unit back. I definitely think Crypt Horrors, they might be better than Crypt Flayers. But I, for some reason, I, I haven't run the math yet. This is the first read-through of the book. I think Crypt Flayers have got something else, specifically because they can fly, but also they have a shooting attack, and then they can charge. So I feel like probably the Crypt Flayers have the math, but they are more expensive, 30 points per more, more per three. So, um, and then you can only get the plus one damage 
to charge for knights in the sub faction where the crypt horrors are battle line and crypt flares are not battle line. So maybe economies of scale crypt horrors work out better, but they're so good. They're so good, and you're going to take a lot of them. The new unit, the Morbeg Knights, are a unit of three. They've got three wounds apiece, and they have a four-up armor save, which makes them one of the more survivable units in our army, and they move 12 inches. So twelve, uh, sorry, nine wounds on a four-up save means they've also got a slightly lower wound cap, but better armor save. And they have got a host of rules, as new models always do. They can fly. And uh, they have got a champion who has plus one attack on this Grizzly Lance. And the standard bearer, one in every three models can be a standard bearer. While this unit includes a standard bearer, if it made a charge move in the same turn, each model in this unit counts as three models for the purpose of contesting objectives, which is really nice. It gives you a purpose for taking them to grab objectives, which is good. It's actually a really good rule. Musicians, one in every three models in this unit can be a horn blower, and you add one to run and charge rolls for this unit while it encodes horn blowers. They've also got shrieking charge. After this unit makes charge move, you can pick an enemy within one inch of this unit. That enemy unit cannot receive unleash hell, which is why I think maybe you would always see a unit of at least three of these in your army, because being able to shut down unleash hell is really, really good. In addition, roll one dice for each model in this unit that's within one inch of that enemy unit. For each four plus, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So if you have three models in your Morbeg Knights unit, you roll three dice, and for every four up, you do D3 mortal wounds, which is also very, very nice and will add to the damage of this unit and is just very good. Uh, and then... Uh, you have the Predator's Pounce. This unit can retreat and still charge later in the same turn. Okay, which is also really good for utility and movement. And if we look at their melee profile, their Grizzly Lance has got two attacks. With Feeding Frenzy, it would be three. Threes and threes, but there are ways to get plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Uh, rend one and damage one. But if they're in the Hollow Mourn sub-faction, that's going to be damage two. Vicious Claws and Teeth has got three attacks. Obviously, with Feeding Frenzy, that'd be four. Threes and threes, you can get plus one to hit, plus one to wound. And Rend one and is damage two. So these are an interesting unit. You can obviously take loads of these, which I think is interesting. You can put them into Deep Strike, which I think is really good. You can actually do a lot of Mortal Wounds from a buffed up unit of these on the Shrieking Charge. So you can keep charging them in, withdrawing them, uh, charging them in again, which I think is very interesting. You can't quite get the same volume of attacks as you can get on the Flares, uh, or you can't get quite as much damage output as the Horrors, but I still think they're very 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 good which is kind of interesting and then knights so you can return them very easily as well you can put a five up ward save on them and a mystic shield so now you're going to end up with a unit that's going to be very survivable and lock units in combat and then they can retreat charge and get back in so i'm kind of torn between horrors morbeg knights and flares and maybe you have a unit of each of th each of those which is interesting these are still good though they're definitely not bad um, and they might be brilliant. I think I've just got to run a few numbers, make sure I can work it out correctly, and they might scale over some of the other units as well. But I definitely think some of those other units get more attacks. I mean, even ghouls get a lot of attacks. Stopping, stopping Unleash Hell is brilliant, and that's definitely a reason I would think about taking this unit. I should also mention that the Zombie Dragon and Terror Geist, both of which are unmounted, are in this book, but they are fairly points expensive compared to them even in the Sob Like Grave Lords book. And ultimately, I don't really care about these models at all. I think they're fine, they've got okay attacks, but I wouldn't take them. I'll take all the other cool stuff. It's cheaper, you can scale attacks on them better. Economies are scaled better as well. You already have some monsters, just, so I'm not that interested, but they do exist inside the book and I thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, in conclusion, and there's so much more to do with this book, we should definitely write some lists and we should make a video about that as well, making some play styles, because there's definitely a shooting list, there's an all monster list, there's loads of ghoul lists, there's a mixed arm list, there's loads of different ways to play. I'd love to know how you want to play this book and what you think the fun combos from this book are. Oh my God, I just remembered that you can take four headsmen and run around trying to kill heroes. Amazing stuff. I love that. Also, I can run around and offer people my infected bone. Brilliant. This book has got loads of flavor and it's got loads of awesome rules, which is exactly what you want from a book. It feels at release a little overcooked in some ways, specifically because of a mechanic I've talked about in some of my kind of like more edited videos, if you want to go back and watch those. Specifically economies of scale. As being pointed out in the chat, 
quite nicely as I'm recording this. Feeding Frenzy, Dad Bod has done this, shout out to him. Feeding Frenzy and Bless This Meal are excellent force multipliers. Being able to add plus one attack onto units is very good. For instance, 20 ghouls generate 20 attacks with Feeding Frenzy, which is very good. Um, so that's in economies of scale. So why would I ever take a monster that adds, I don't know, a couple of attacks per profile when I could add 20 attacks to a unit or I could add some attacks to some uh, Crypt Horrors or something? So those are economies of scale which work really well and it tells you, like, you know, do this. Feeding Frenzy is important. Get plus one attack on all your profiles. In addition, being able to do Bless This Meal, which is the prayer I've been talking about for the entire kind of show, and being able to heal models, uh, wounds back into units is very good. Sorry, wounds back onto like monsters or big units is very effective. And the challenge of Ushran being able to heal models back into like low wound count units like Ghouls or Crypt Guard also makes this an economies of scale army. So that's very effective as well. It's brilliant. There are so many ways to play. Ushran is really good. Gorky on Terror Guy is still excellent. Each of the three knight units, or in fact, all of the infantry are get great. Crypt Horrors, great. Crypt Guard, great and fulfill a role. And the Beast Flares, really good as well. All the heroes are interesting. You can do headsmen running around, judges doing stuff. Uh, <laughs> the Smash Bat is now the Smash Bat and Dash, or the Smash and Dash Bat, and he's great as well. Or he, they, whatever, it's a ghoul. Uh, are great. Prayers are good. Spells are good. Um, you've got some real options. There's Jank in being able to, you know, set up a unit from reserve or a unit that died, which is crazy. I keep forgetting you can return six night models to a unit. That's crazy. And then you can pre-move them and, and move D6. It's a great book. You've got loads of stuff to play with in this book. Might be a little bit overcooked for tournament play at the moment. I think that's something to be conscious of. Um, definitely something... Some of those abilities are stackable, and that's a mistake, and they definitely... Mm -hmm are going to be thank you to dad bod for donating some money for the show which does help remind me that if you did enjoy this video you can support me creating content like this on the honest war gamer patreon or another great way if you don't have any money to help support the show is like leave some comments and share this video that's actually the thing i'd like most i love age of sigma and if you get the opportunity to share this video with your friends who might be interested in flesh eater courts and they want to hear what i think is a, a an analytical review with a little bit of fun uh, hopefully it's good and you can show your friends which would be fun so do that thank you very much for tuning in i hope you've enjoyed the video and you're all brilliant